No. <laughs> Thank you. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 26 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Ciccone. Dear Mr. President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The Morrison government's continual failure to deliver, leaving Australians to suffer the consequences. Uh, is the proposal supported? I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Senator Pratt. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, we have a very broad but a very apt MPI on the table today. It does indeed give us an opportunity to highlight this government's, the Morrison government's, continual failure to deliver that is indeed leaving Australians to suffer the consequences. And this is happening in every corner of our nation. Whether you're a tradie in the outer suburbs that's lost their job, whether you're a childcare worker that lost their job during the so-called free childcare period because your childcare centre that you're at couldn't afford to stay open, uh, whether you are a casual worker who didn't qualify for JobKeeper and uh, is now unemployed, whether you're a disability support pensioner who didn't get any extra payment uh, but is having an increasingly uh, a, a higher cost of living uh, because of things like needing to catch taxis instead of being able uh, to take public transport. The government bench, as we've heard this day after day in question time answers, they're very, very happy to deliver the Prime Minister Scotty from Marketing's advertising campaign messages, but they refuse to acknowledge uh, the Senator Prime Minister. Pratt, Senator Pratt, a point of order has been called. Madam Deputy President, on a point of order, it is disorderly to refer to members of the other chamber, or any chamber for that matter, in any way other than their appropriate title. So I wonder if you could remind Senator Pratt to use appropriate titles when referring to members of parliament. Could I remind all senators to please use appropriate titles uh, for our colleagues? Our Prime Minister, uh, Scott Morrison, is very focused on his advertising, but not on the execution and delivery, as the answers given in question time from uh, all of those opposite refuse to acknowledge any of their mistakes or bungles or mis-executions. We saw that just this afternoon uh, from uh, Senator Colbeck, where he was lauding uh, the seniors' emergency food delivery uh, as an example of where they were making the best laid plans in case they were needed. In case they were needed. Well, they were needed. I've spoken to many a pensioner who was uh, grateful for uh, home delivery from Coles or Woolies, or indeed who lined up outside the many food banks in our nation. Uh, and one of the reasons they were lining up well, because they couldn't buy toilet paper, because when they went down to the shopping centre, there was none there. So don't try and tell me that pensioners didn't need uh, that extra support during that time. You just didn't get around to rolling it out. Let's have a look at some of the other examples. JobKeeper, a massive underspend. Billions of dollars that were supposed to keep people connected to their jobs hasn't been spent. And guess what? We've got a rising and record level of unemployment. My office has been inundated with calls from people who've had trouble getting through to Centrelink to get the support that they need. Uh, all of this, you know, this is off the back of an overstretched system that was forced to deliver this government's ridiculous and unfair robo debt. When this government, uh, when, when the system was overloaded, when Centrelink collapsed because of the number of calls and applications, they didn't acknowledge it was their fault. They just said they'd been cyber attacked. Again, marketing and spin and nothing to see here, but the devil is always in the execution, and this government 
is failing on every turn. Robo debt. We've seen since 2017 uh, example after example of how unfair, unjust, and claims that it was illegal. But instead of listening to that, the government had to be taken to court to prove that it was illegal. And yet, what do we get from those opposite? In, question, uh, in taking note this week, I did hear indeed Senator Stoker justify the use of robo-debt despite the fact that the Prime Minister had just apologised for its use. And I think Senator Stoker said something along the lines, and of course she'll correct me and pull me to order later if I'm wrong. She said, of course, the government's got the right to retrieve debts that are owed. That's our responsibility to the taxpayer. And of course that is the case. But of course the government could not prove that these debts were in fact owed at all. Hence the illegality of the whole program. Because you're not supposed to send a debt collector out after someone, which is what this government did. You sent debt collectors out to chase people for their Centrelink debts. You're not supposed to send a debt collector uh, after someone unless you can prove that the debt is actually owed, which you couldn't. The Home Renovator Scheme, promising to keep tradies in jobs. Well, that's if you uh, are able to qualify it. I don't know anyone planning to spend $150,000 on renovating their house and can also meet the income limits. But if it does get things started, well, what's going to happen? This scheme uh, cuts off uh, later this year. This government talks about uh, you've got to have your contract signed and start uh, work, I think, by December. But everything that this government is doing on snapback it absolutely uh, terrifies me in terms of any good work that this government is doing with any of the stimulus that it's injecting into the economy, any of that good work being completely undone because of the government's snap back agenda, snapping back before the economy is ready. If you uh, your execution of these issues is absolutely uh, dreadful. I call on the government uh, to really think about what it's doing. We need a properly executed plan for our nation in these times of need. And yet day after day after day, all that is revealed is the terrible, terrible mess that you are making. It is time for this government to fess up from, uh, about its mistakes instead of just relying time and time and time again on your marketing pictures. Marketing pictures that have absolutely nothing to do with the truth that's going on for ordinary Australians who are suffering the consequences. Senator Betts. Madam Acting Deputy President, while there are rort scams, secret bugging, secret recordings, funny money, cash deals in Aldi bags going on within the Australian Labor Party, they come in here pretending to the Australian people that somehow the Morrison government is not delivering. Here I have a document, 20 pages, with 20 achievements on each page. And if you no, your numbers, that might be about 400 achievements that we can point to. But having been in opposition now for some seven years, you would have thought the Australian Labor Party would be using an opportunity such as this to tell the Australian people about their positive forward agenda. No. All we heard was seven minutes' worth of criticism, of unrelenting negativity unrelenting negativity, no alternate plan for the Australian people, no plan for jobs, no reason for the Australian Labor Party to put jobs first. We in the coalition know the jobs are vital, vital for people's mental health, physical health, self-esteem, social interaction, vitally important. And that is why the Prime Minister and the government has said time and time again Jobs are front and centre of our policy development and our policy delivery. But what do the Labor Party do? 
being confronted with a huge scandal in Victoria. Looks as though it's leaked over from the border in New South Wales. Those two Labor parties, possibly they should have had border protection between those two states, Madam Acting Deputy President, but those two states absolutely wrecked with scandal. What do they come to do? They come into this place making assertions, false assertions, to try to distract attention from the dilemma that they face. And so we had the spectre of the would-be Prime Minister of this country addressing CEDA, the Committee for the Economic Development of Australia. And I think his big picture vision was that we might have national driver's licences. Really big picture stuff. Yeah, visionary, visionary. I'm sure people like Bob Hawke and John Curtin would be thinking, if only we could have come up with such a dynamic policy formulation for the future of our nation. But of course, why is the Australian Labor Party so bereft of any policies? Because it is so self-consumed in the internal warfare, branch stacking, funny money, Aldi bags, you name it. And so even when the Morrison government is delivering from a space agency right through to child protection, right across the board, we have the hapless opposition twixt and between deciding whether or not they might actually support mandatory sentencing for those that abuse the most pre precious thing within our community, namely our children. Our mandatory sentencing for border protection, they agreed with that, but not for people that abuse our children, the next generation. Where was the policy thought? Where was the policy formulation? Let alone where was the moral compass in determining that mandatory sentencing should not be part and parcel of the criminal law, especially when you were confronted with the fact that 39 per cent of those convicted of child sex offences weren't sent to jail. It's hard to imagine a more horrific crime. And yet the Labor Party twixt and between, not knowing how or why they should be protecting our children because they're consumed by their internal warfare, their internal hatred, their factionalism, you name it, and so they take their eye off the ball. But if we want to talk about the litany of policy failures, can I remind those opposite that if you live in a glass house, it's very foolish to throw rocks. And that, of course, is what the Australian Labor Party has done with bringing this forward. Because if the Labor Party want to throw rocks of policy failures, I can hear one pane of glass smashing as I mention live cattle exports, another pane of glass smashing as I mention pink bats, another pane of glass being smashed when I mention the cash splash to the dead. And so the list goes on. And who could forget fuel, uh, uh, fuel watch, grocery choice? The list of policy failures, and then, of course, on top of it all, was the legacy of deficit and debt, which is a mortgage and an imposition on the next generation of Australians. Completely immoral, completely and utterly immoral in circumstances where you put such a millstone around the neck of the next generation. And so, Madam Acting Deputy President, it is with a I suppose I'm somewhat gobsmacked that the cheek of the Australian Labor Party to come in here to assert that somehow Mr Morrison has failed to deliver in circumstances where we have faced a pandemic, a one in a century problem. And I think most people recognise that Prime Minister Morrison has handled that exceptionally well with his bringing together of a national cabinet, of dealing with the border closures, protecting Australia before the World Health Organisation was even willing to admit 
that we had a pandemic on our hands and that closing our international borders might be a good idea. Leading from the, from the front, delivering for the Australian people, and all you've got to do is do a comparison of the death rates. And the last time I looked, Madam Acting Deputy President, we had, I think, four deaths per million of population, whereas our cousins in the United Kingdom were confronted with 482 per million. 100 times the mortality and fatality rate in the UK. And yet the Australian Labor Party comes in here and talks about policy failure. Excuse me, with a record like that, the world is looking to Australia as I speak, asking how is it that you have achieved such a, such a good result. And it's through hard policy discussion, delivery and making it happen. And so, Madam Acting Deputy President, we have this hapless senator from New South Wales interjecting, suggesting we were listening to Victoria Labor. Can I tell you, that would be the last thing anybody in Australia would want to do today. Listen to what's coming out of the Victorian Labor Party, other than if you were interested in 60 Minutes and all the disclosures there. But I would have thought using the Victorian Labor Party as the gleaming star example of Labor Party success is indicative how bereft the Federal Labor Party is. They actually look to the Victorian Labor Party as some sort of guiding light. How desperate would you have to be to look to Mr Andrews and his state government with that? How many ministers have now resigned? I think it was three or four. And uh, how many others are uh, under a cloud? So can I say to those opposite, if you want to be treated seriously by the Australian people, come forward with a positive policy agenda. It is no use just throwing rocks and hoping that the Australian people will be distracted from your own failure in relation to policy. Just look at defence. Six years and not a single major project was started, thought about, let alone delivering jobs for our fellow Australians. So be it in defence, be it in welfare, be it in border protection, be it in trying to balance the budget. The list goes on and on and on of positive policy achievements for the betterment of the welfare of the people of Australia, which stands in such stark contradistinction to what the Australian Labor Party have to offer. Scandal, scams, bugging each other, reporting each other to the police, and all the time they do that, they fail to deliver a positive agenda for the Australian people. So more than happy, Madam Acting Deputy President, to support Mr Morrison and his government. Thank you very much. Your time has expired. Senator Seward. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to make, today to make a contribution to this MPI to raise the Morrison government's failure to adequately invest in the care economy. The government is failing to take the opportunity to make sure that as we come out of this crisis, we focus on a better normal, addressing our health, economic, climate and inequality crisis. An element that has been, uh, wh where the government has been missing is underinvesting in and which must be part of our recovery is the care economy. For too long we have ignored the wellbeing and economic benefits from investing in social and community services. Investment in social infrastructure such as community and social services, education, health, aged care and childcare um, has a positive impact on the whole of society. Not only does this address inequality and well-being, but increases productivity and generates future revenue. A focus on preventative health and social care and is, an, is an investment in future well-being that also reduces the need for further public expenditure if we are addressing these issues. New research from the Open University sheds light on the economic and social benefits investing in, as they call it, care, the care industry. 
Researchers found that if Australia invested 1 per cent of its GDP in the care industry, this would result in raising the employment rate by 1.2 per cent. If we invested the same amount in the construction industry, it would only increase the employment rate by 0.2 per cent. Now, that's not to say that construction isn't important. Issues such as public transport, renewable energy and social housing must be invested in. But that is not enough for our recovery. Furthermore, investment in the, in the care economy would help reduce the gender employment gap. Research showed that 79% of the research showed that 79% of new jobs created through investment in the care industry would be filled by women. There are clearly striking benefits to investing in education, health, so, and social services and community services. Benefits that you would think that any government investing and navigating our way out of this crisis and recession would be interested in capitalising on. It just, it just shows how critical the, econ the care economy is to our recovery. This research is very important and I urge the government to take it on board. The social fabric of our nation is important. In the midst of a recession, we need a new way of doing things. I urge the government to recognise the value of the care economy and start investing to deliver access to essential services for all Australians. Thank you, Senator Seward. Senator Ayres. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. I listened with some interest uh, to the answer that the Minister for Aged Care gave uh, during question time. I don't think there would be any other country in the Western world where the Minister for Aged Care would simultaneously be the Minister for Youth, but that's what the Morrison government's delivered uh, the people of Australia. Uh, and Minister Colbeck, Senator Colbeck's answers in question time are an enduring delight for everybody, I'm sure. But uh, the minister was asked about the performance of the government in relation to a promise that it made to deliver 36,000 food packages to elderly Australians. Uh, and like many of the announcements that the Morrison government makes, they're breathlessly made with press releases, videos, uh, uh, government ministers standing in front of microphones, uh, but very little delivery. Uh, the delivery in this case, 36,000 promised, 38 delivered. Even my high school maths tells me that that's not uh, 10 per cent, uh, not 1 per cent, 0.01 per cent delivery. Uh, it is an emblem of the government's failure. It's an emblem of uh, the failure of the government's, the, the cancer that goes to the heart of this government's approach to policy delivery and delivering for all Australians. Today, in the other place, the Prime Minister was asked about the impact uh, on women giving birth, travelling, who have to travel to either Canberra or Goulburn. Uh, from yes. His answer? Well, there might need to be some improvements to the road system. Out of touch, out of his depth, entirely devoted to spin, uh, no capacity for the policy substance. And there are so many examples. Well, the National Party doesn't have a minister, a minister representing the Minister for Agriculture in this place. But the commitments that they have made to Australian agriculture and the Australian farming industry, biosecurity levy, no delivery. Real-time payment platform for dairy farmers, breathlessly announced during the election campaign, uh, the minister crawled back from that proposition today. Another policy failure, another failure to deliver on behalf of this government. And that would have meant something for Australian dairy farmers. Government promised to deal with dollar milk and the floor price for dairy farmers, no delivery. Drought response, no delivery. Not all the money has gone out the door. The government appears incompetent at delivering money to Australian farmers. They can fill the advertising budgets of the agencies. They can send, uh, they can send people dri driving around all over the country, but no real delivery. 
the coronavirus response that I listened to Senator Abetz about. The Australian results so far, the public health response has delivered a very good outcome. If you look at the people who are admired by some of the characters over there, um, uh, the, the absolute disaster of policy failure on these issues in the United States, uh, in Brazil, in the United Kingdom, the failure of the government responses there, delivered, driven by the kind of politics that animates some people on the government's backbench, uh, is a cautionary tale. But this Prime Minister took a very long time to get there, and it was only the response of the state premiers that dragged the Prime Minister to reaching the right policy conclusions. Meanwhile, in New South Wales, the failure of Border Force and this Prime Minister uh, and the Border Force Minister to stop the Ruby Princess has delivered misery to every four corners of the Australian continent. Uh, misery in every state, infections in every state, many, many deaths as a result of that policy failure. The coalition's economic response, uh, job seeker, no certainty about what's going to happen when there's a snapback of job seeker. Prior to the uh, announcement of the scheme, universally acknowledged by everybody except those on the other side uh, that Centrelink payments were too low for unemployed Australians, snapback will have dire consequences. JobKeeper, a policy demanded by Labor, mocked by people in here up until a few days before the government announced it. But there are serious policy failures there too. Millions of Australian casuals excluded. Universities excluded. Uh, overseas students left to starve. Australia's reputation shattered overseas. Food queues in all of our major cities of overseas students who can't pay their bills, can't get enough to eat. The entertainment and arts sector left to starve, left to fail. Uh, by a government that doesn't understand its responsibilities. And then there's this enormous error, a $60 billion error in forecasting and delivery of that policy. As the Leader of the Opposition said, you could see it from space. In fact, the Americans managed to put a man on the moon spending less than $60 billion in today's dollar terms. It is the biggest forecasting de policy delivery error in Australian history, I imagine it's probably the biggest error in the Southern Hemisphere. The one thing that the Minister for Finance can be confident of, the one achievement he can notch up there, is he can be certain that nobody will make an error that big. He is in the record books, uh, he is in the record books for the biggest policy error in Australian political history. That is the end of the Morrison government's economic credibility. They needn't knock at the door of economic credibility ever again. Uh, it's the overconfidence and the smugness that leads to policy neglect. And that error has real consequences. Rating agencies made decisions about the position that they took in relation to the Australian economy. People made investment decisions. Many, many more people are unemployed because of that policy failure. The Home Builder Scheme. You couldn't design a scheme if you got the cleverest people in the country and you said to them, I want you to design a scheme that reaches almost nobody. And when it does reach them, it's going to fund them a little bit extra to do a project that they were already going to deliver. To devise a policy scheme that would provide no extra stimulus to the Australian economy. None uh, but drive inequality up, emblematic of this government's approach. Pre-COVID, pre-coronavirus, the government had nothing to boast about. Downward pressure on wages, flatlining wages, downward pressure on retail spending, lowering business investment, decreased productivity, monetary policy on its knees. The Reserve Bank begging the government to actually do something, fiscal policy in all sorts of trouble, no plan. All sorts of other policy areas. The federal ICAC that the government promised they, they would deliver, no delivery. 
Energy policy, Senator Canavan's favourite thing. Well, there's plenty of policies. There's been 17 of them, none delivered. They've managed to construct an environment in energy policy where prices go up, emissions go up, investment goes down, and confidence is shattered. The uh, manufacturing industry is forced offshore because of your policy failure and incapacity to develop a plan. Senator Canavan's mad plan for a new expensive coal-fired power station would only serve to add to the policy chaos in energy policy on the other side and push prices up further, increase emissions further and drive more industry offshore. He knows it. He know, he's smart enough to know it, but he'll continue to press that case because it suits him. Apprentices, 140,000 less apprentices, robo-debt. And finally, in terms of delivery, we have the government's position in re relation to Australia Post. Well, policy delivery there will mean that many less people in regional areas, they will all be getting their mail later because of Scott Morrison's plan for Australia Post. The problem with these people is that they believe their own spin. Uh, they believe their own spin, they are condemned to repeat it, and the grave and serious issues that face Australia in terms of our future economy, Australia's place in a more dangerous world, dealing with climate change, making sure that we reconcile effectively with our first Australians, the future of our rivers, our country towns, they are not up to the task of charting our course for modern Australia in thank very you, challenging Senator times. Is. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I, thought, I thought this um, MPI was going to be focused on, on, on the failure to deliver for Australians in the coronavirus. That's where, uh, uh, that's where Senator Ayres was focused on in most of his contribution. But you can tell, you can tell he ran out of steam there because by the end he, he, he didn't have much more to say. He started talking about energy policy and all these other things. Yep, sure, that we have disagreements on. But it is a shame, uh, Madam Deputy President, that, that the Australian Labor Party can't, can't bring themselves uh, to uh, share a bit of the pride that I think most Australians feel uh, about how the country responded over the past few months. It's uh, been a challenging time uh, for our nation. It's been more challenging for some uh, than others. Uh, but one thing I think we can take heart uh, from as a nation uh, is that overall uh, we have responded in a united, committed, uh, determined way uh, to tackle this virus and to support each other through it. Uh, that cooperation, that determination has been led uh, by the Prime Minister, uh, Scott Morrison. Uh, he's led that, uh, that commitment. Uh, he's been supported by other governments around the country. And, and all I'm happy to say here he's been supported uh, by governments of the other side of politics and mine, uh, by the Labor Party, by Liberal national governments uh, across the country, have come together uh, to cooperate in support uh, uh, to do the right thing by our country. What I'm most proud of, though, what I'm most proud of, though, is how the Australian people have come together uh, to fight uh, uh, this virus. How the Australian people have, again, overall uh, complied with the onerous restrictions that have been placed on their livelihoods. That, in good humour uh, and with steely determination, uh, have have sought to respond and adjust to the changed economic circumstances facing them. I, I'm astounded by the resilience of so many. Uh, small business people in this country who have had their livelihoods turned upside down but have dusted themselves off, got on with what they could do and made the best of what has been a pretty, pretty hard road for some. That's what I'm proud of. I'm proud of it. And it's just a shame that the opposition here can't bring themselves to express even just one iota of that pride, of that shared uh, achievement of this country, uh, because by any measure this nation uh, has responded as well, if not better, than almost any country in the world uh, to this threat. We have stayed largely united. We have complied uh, with and done what we needed to do uh, to protect the safety of others, and we are supporting each other uh, in uh, the fallout from what we've had to do and also the rebuilding effort that is to come. Uh, uh, that is something I think we should uh, take pride in. Now, that's, of course, not to say that every decision governments have made around the country has been precisely perfect. Uh, uh, but overall, overall, 
uh, uh, we have made sure uh, that we, uh, we have responded in a way that has uh, uh, protected Australians' health, uh, that we have supported those that have needed assistance and that we are now also focused on rebuilding and creating jobs uh, as we recover uh, from what's happened the last few months. I think it's been particularly uh, responsive that uh, our government has made sure, the Liberal National Party government, has made sure that it's parked any ideological or, 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 or commitment, uh, commitments that we may have previously made and done what is right. Done what is right. I think the problem is here that the Australian Labor Party haven't quite caught up with the program. They still think that somehow the caricature of what they present as the Liberal National Party is true, that somehow we're mean, evil-spirited people uh, uh, who only want to deliver budget surpluses because we like to be mean and evil-spirited. Mean -spirited. No, we deliver those surpluses because they're important to protect future generations of Australians, but when other priorities come along, as they have here in the last few months, of course, we adjust because the end objective is to deliver for Australians, and that is what we have done. That is what we have done. We also, though, must at some stage return to the uh, important point that we cannot keep spending forever, uh, that we have to be mindful of uh, the debt that is being racked up because all of the spending, all of the assistance we have provided in the last few months has been borrowed money. We've had to borrow uh, uh, a lot of it from overseas uh, uh, to, to support Australians. It's the right thing to do right now. But it has to be repaid. Uh, it is not our money down here. It is, it is the Australian people's debt that will be repaid uh, from themselves and their children and grandchildren. And we will make sure and commit ourselves to the prudent application of funds to support Australians to get us through this crisis and rebuild our nation. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I support this submission. In recent letters to the Prime Minister in March, April and May, we expressed concern over the government's use of flawed modelling data to justify locking us all away and causing untold damage to our economy, businesses and jobs. The responses to these letters did not address the real issues. Yet it was stated, quote from the government, the government is well aware of the heavy economic and social toll created by the restrictions. Well, today, now, we need to know where the plan is to rebuild our businesses and jobs. Or will the Prime Minister just cut the COVID lifeline and feed our, work and feed our workers and businesses to the sharks? We are already hearing about insolvency practices preparing to wind up many struggling Australian businesses, and as many as one in six could disappear soon. Back in the global financial crisis, the Labor government applied academic models which left us with high budget deficits and public debt. Yet they did not address the real problems, and soon we may have a national debt of well over $1 trillion and nothing to show for it. What due diligence on flawed infection modelling from Professor Ferguson in Britain was done? That locked us all up. If this government had learned early from nations like Taiwan and promptly adopted rigorous testing combined with strict isolation for people with the virus and isolation of the vulnerable, then the rest would have been returned to work far, far sooner with minimal economic disruption. Taiwan, for example, isolated the sick and vulnerable. The healthy continued working. They have a strong economy. Their health is 15 times better than Australia. The Prime Minister will really be tested in October when the support stops and we see businesses and our economy unravel. Sorry, Senator Green. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. At the start of this pandemic, as many Australians across the country watched daily press conferences, each time the number went up and up about the restrictions that would be put in place, I know that many Australians' um, stomachs just sank, and particularly our arts and entertainment workers, who knew with every new restriction that was announced and every new restriction that was increased, there would be some of the first jobs to go and theirs, their jobs would be some of the last to come back. I know this because when those announcements were being made, I was sitting next to an arts worker, my wife. And as the ghost lights were switched on in theatres across the country, 
This government ghosted arts workers. In far north Queensland, we have a vibrant arts community. And this is backed up by a strong lineup of Indigenous performers from the Cape and the Torres Strait Islands and other regions across outback Queensland. Every year, several arts and dance festivals are held, including the Cairns International Arts Fest Festival, which has had to go online this year. It is incredibly disappointing, I know, for many of those performers and workers that the uh, income that they get from the um, events that were due to be held um, won't be coming in this year. But it is even more devastating that those workers were not included in the government's plans to support people through JobKeeper. Now, there might be some people in here that think that regional Queenslanders don't care about the arts, but I know that that's not true because they do talk to me everywhere I go in regional Queensland about the arts industry. And I know this because I was in, Queen, in regional Queensland in Stanthorpe, actually, when the government uh, axed the arts department. And I was in Stanthorpe because they were facing a water crisis. And I was um, pleased to find out, apart from the fact that they were talking about water security, one of the things that they were very concerned about was this government's record on the arts. Arts and entertainment workers are among millions excluded from the government's JobKeeper program. The structure of JobKeeper was designed in a way to exclude performers employed in the arts and entertainment sector, and it is having real life consequences. These workers, who often make ends meet from gig to gig, have been forced to deal with the complete shutdown of their industry on their own. And we know that in many parts of regional Queensland and other regional areas across the country, arts and entertainment workers are actually employed by local councils. And local council workers were also excluded from JobKeeper. But in another cruel blow, many arts and entertainment workers fund the jobs that they love so much by picking up casual hospitality jobs from time to time. Those jobs were also excluded from JobKeeper, unless that they had worked for their employer for more than 12 months. These heartless exclusions really cut deep, and that's because it hurts when you feel like you're not worth government support, even though you do a valuable job. Arts and entertainment workers do the jobs that they do because they love their work. Their creativity is tied up in their identity, and I know that it would be absolutely devastating for them to not be able to do that work right now. And they understand the reasons why and the restrictions that are in place, and they, are, they want to um, get back to work as soon as those restrictions are lifted. But throughout this period, they've been doing that on their own. Of course, the government won't even acknowledge that there is a problem, even though they've been whispering now for a little while about a specific rescue package for the arts sector. If the government is going to raise expectations for these, for these workers, then it is better to deliver genuine support for workers. There is an official parliamentary petition calling on the Morrison government to support arts and entertainment workers through the coronavirus crisis, and it has passed more than 30,000 signatures this week. This incredible support makes this one of the most successful parliamentary petitions in recent years, with three, years, three weeks yet to run. The response is yet more evidence that this is an industry in crisis crying out for help from this government, and it is an industry supported by our community. We have called for a com comprehensive industry support package, including support for workers themselves, many of whom have been shut out of the gov government's JobKeeper wage subsidy. At the start of June, the government gave those workers a glimmer of hope, as I said, by suggesting that there be a rescue package on the way. But now, two weeks later, there's still nothing, and these workers are desperately waiting for that assistance. Why did the government raise expectations just to let these people down once again? Well, the Palaszczuk Labor government has delivered $42.5 million for the arts industry, and that includes $22.5 million announced yesterday. 
that funding will go to focus on stabilising local art companies and seeing that jobs for arts, artists and arts workers are protected. We know that arts workers are resilient. The show must and will go on. As I said at the beginning of my speech, many ghost lights were lit um, in theatres all across the country during this time. And I thought I'd share some words from Ange Sullivan, who's the head of the Sydney Opera House Lighting. And he said that they have um, uh, ghost lights, uh, they have two main functions, if anyone doesn't know what they do. There's a practical reason, obviously, to make sure that if anyone goes into the theatre, they can see where they're going, they don't fall off the, the front of the stage. But there's, a really, there's another romantic idea about ghost lights, and it's that every theatre has at least one ghost. And when they come out at night, we don't want them bumping into scenery or disturbing props. It's a, it is a romantic notion, um, this uh, using ghost lights during this time, but it's also desperately, desperately sad because arts workers feel so alone at the moment. Ange went on to say, we decided that the entire house needed something to look forward to, a beacon, if you like, it's about saying, we haven't gone forever, we're coming back and we're going to leave the lights on to show you that. Well, every arts worker will remember that this government ghosted them when it mattered. Every arts worker in this country will remember the amount of times that they asked for help and they were not listened to. Arts workers are really, really struggling, not only because they have lost their jobs, but because they can't do what they love to do right now. So I'm calling on the Morrison government to deliver that rescue package and to help these arts workers Senator in the Green, future. Your time has expired. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr. President. I know it has been a rough week for Labor members, especially ones from Victoria. But I'm not sure Senator Ciccone had finished drafting the MPI before submitting, given both its lack of specificity and its blatant deception. Because the Morrison government is proud of what it's delivered and continues to deliver for our nation. Throughout this unprecedented time, our focus is on fighting the virus, delivering the economic lifeline Australians need to get through the course of the virus, reopening our economy and our society with a clear road ahead, building confidence and momentum in our economy and growing our economy for the years ahead. This is a five-year plan that will shape our country for the next 30 years. That means we're getting Australians out from under the doona, we're delivering jobs, guaranteeing the essential services Australians rely on, getting children back into school, keeping Australians safe and taking care of our economy. We have the JobMaker Plan to get Australia moving, focused on infrastructure and deregulation. This includes almost $72 billion in major infrastructure projects across the country being fast-tracked, slashing approval times and creating 66,000 jobs. And because the government recognises that in these unprecedented times, some Australians will need to depend on government assistance in the short term. We've already temporarily supercharged the social security safety net, providing additional assistance to Australians affected by the economic impacts of the pandemic. Payments are rolling out for the $70 billion JobKeeper program, including a $1,500 per fortnight wage subsidy for 3.5 million Australians. We have a $150 million domestic violence support package to help family and domestic violence support services meet the growing demand as a result of the impacts of the coronavirus crisis. We're supporting senior Australians through two new initiatives to prevent loneliness and social isolation under a $6 million communications package. The government's also awarded $1 million in grants to 215 local community organisations to provide at-risk seniors with digital devices such as mobile phones and laptops. The Morrison government is continuing to take action to help Australians whose mental health and wellbeing is affected by the pandemic by providing an additional $48 million to the support 
and the Mental Health and Wellbeing Pandemic Response Plan. And the list goes on. And we were delivering prior to COVID, and we will continue to deliver in the face of this crisis and beyond. We were already seeing increases in job creation, increases in female participation in the workforce, and we are looking to the future, ready to build on that. The Morrison government is delivering. We're focused on taking care of people now and setting our nation up for success in the coming decades. We all know the impacts of the coronavirus across the economy and that they've been severe. Businesses and households are facing increased uncertainty and economic activity has slowed significantly. But it is this government's economic support package that's provided timely support to affected workers, businesses and the broader community, and has kept Australians in work and businesses in businesses. We've put a floor under the economy and will lay the foundation for a strong economic recovery. The government's focusing on reopening and rebuilding. We need to get businesses back open, enable Australians to go back to work and ensure consumers and businesses have the confidence to return to normal activities. But in respect to Senator Ciccone and the point that he may have been trying to make, there are some things we are very proud that we failed to deliver. And quite frankly, the Australian electorate are pretty relieved that we have. We have failed to deliver a retiree tax. We failed to deliver limitations to negative gearing that would see increases in the rental prices and decimate the property investment market. We failed to deliver a pink bats program that literally led to tragic deaths. We failed to deliver unwanted and overpriced school halls. We failed to deliver checks to dead people. We failed to deliver cash in Audi bags. We failed to deliver cash in folders along with fake ALP membership forms. We failed to deliver a protection racket for pedophiles rather than protect Australian children. And we definitely showed a failure to sell out Australia to the highest bidder. Unlike those opposite, we are not failing the Australian people. We are delivering the economic health and security they need now and into the future. Senator Hughes, your time has expired. Senator Rice. That the Morrison government <coughs> has failed to deliver, it sure has. It has failed to deliver a society where First Nations peoples are safe and equal, a society free of racism and discrimination. The Morrison government has failed to deliver justice to our First Australians. That's why tens of thousands of people have been protesting in the streets. Yet what does the Prime Minister focus on when asked about police brutality and black deaths in custody. He praises statues of colonisers, he denies slavery and he condemns protesters. He is definitely silent on the racist policies and institutions that are costing lives and tearing families apart. If only he cared as much about black lives as he does about protecting statues. Black lives are at risk every day in Australia, and even with all the media and public attention on police violence, it hasn't stopped police officers from attacking innocent people. On Monday, the South Australian police assaulted and wrongfully arrest arrested Noel Henry. This violence isn't unusual, but this time it was filmed. And South Australian police have now started an internal investigation. Police officers investigating other police officers, we know how that will end. And just today we have learnt that a senior counter-terrorism police officer in New South Wales delivered a gross and mocking acknowledgement of country at a police Christmas party last year. This speech was reworded to acknowledge the tactical operations unit nation instead of traditional owners. It was stomach-churning and disgusting and shows the unbridled disrespect and contempt that police have for First Nations peoples. First Nations peoples in Australia are the most incarcerated group per capita anywhere in the world. We have seen 437 black deaths in custody and not one conviction. Every day news stories emerge of how differently Indigenous people in this country are treated to everyone else. And this is all happening on their land, on stolen land. It is this original and ongoing sin that has taken root in our unequal power structures, our racist institutions and in our laws. Yet the Morrison government is nowhere 
We must stop police brutality and systemic racism against First Nations peoples and other people of colour. Colour. We must make up for our original sin, dismantle systems of oppression and finally see justice for First Nations peoples. And all of us must examine our own settler colonial history, listen to and centre black voices and actively work to decolonise. Senator Van. The Acting Deputy Chair, I rise to speak on this matter of public importance and I'd like to start by thanking my very good friend fellow Collingwood supporter and Senator for Victoria, Senator Ciccone, for this Dorothy Dixer. It is wonderful to have the opportunity to highlight the role of the Morrison government has had in delivering jobs, guaranteeing essential services, keeping Australians safe and taking care of our country. But let's be frank. For those opposite, the past week must have felt like the red wedding episode of the Game of Thrones. I believe Senator Ciccone is probably the only Victorian parliamentarian not checking for reds under the bed at the moment. But for many Victorians, the past year has been a year like no other. Sorry, Kimberly. Uh, from the drought to bushfires and now the COVID pandemic, the Morrison government has been there every step of the way. It is coming up to a year since I took my seat in this place. So let's go to the highlight reel and discuss what the Morrison government has actually delivered. Well, in my first week in this place, we delivered $158 billion in tax cuts. Not a bad start to the year. In response to the, the drought, the Australian government had committed over $8 billion across the country to support the drought response, recovery and preparedness actions. Then, uh, the, uh, the bushfires came along, and earlier this week I spoke about the significant support that the Morrison government had made to uh, bushfires. I was also lucky enough to spend some time with Blaze Aid down in Gippsland, where I saw firsthand the damage that the fires had done, and it was clear to me that the effort needed to recover from this was going to be enormous and long-lasting. So, to that end, the Morrison government delivered on that as well. Through the National Bushfire Recovery Agency, we've committed $2 billion, that's $2 billion, regional bushfire recovery and development program. And of that, $1.3 billion has been spent so far. That has looked after 281,000 Australians who have received direct financial support through disaster recovery and allowance payments. Additionally, 23,000 businesses have received direct financial assistance. Then, while working on the bushfire recovery, the coronavirus pandemic hit, and the Morrison government initiated one of the most successful responses in the world, saving tens of thousands of lives and millions of livelihoods. The Commonwealth, in support of the coronavirus pandemic, has already committed $260 billion towards mitigating the economic impacts of the coronavirus. In that, there's $70 billion of payments are rolling out for the JobKeeper program, including $1,500 per fortnight wage subsidy, keeping 3.5 million Australians in their jobs. For those that lost their jobs or didn't have one, we've established a, a, a new time-limited coronavirus supplement to be paid at the rate of $550 per fortnight on top of the existing $550 per fortnight. So to say that, that there has been a failure in letting people fall through the cracks is just not true. There's also been payments of up to $100,000 to eligible small and medium-sized businesses and not-for-profits. Additionally, $200 million will go towards more than 300 charities to support the community. For mental health, $48 million to support uh, the pandemic response plan was presented to National Cabinet last week. In order to get the country moving out of the pandemic crisis, we have committed a further $1.5 billion to immediately start work on small priority projects defined by the states and territories. And of that $1 billion is going to projects that are now shovel ready and $500 million reserved specifically to target road safety works. And I should remind the, the Senate that this builds on around $7.8 billion worth of projects we brought forward since last year. And I, I'd just like to show uh, you know, that 
the, com the combined um, contribution of the states and territories only totals $3.6 billion. So the federal government, the Morrison government, has delivered eight times what the states have done. And in my home state of Victoria, they've only delivered a paltry $5.2 billion in initiatives. So, colleagues, I think it's safe to say the Morrison government has not failed in any way, shape or form, but has delivered incredibly Senator well Bain, for the country. Your time has expired. Senator Waters. Well, thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to speak on the matter of public importance that the uh, Morrison government has uh, failed to deliver. Well, I'll tell you who it hasn't failed to deliver for—vested interests and its big business donors. They're doing quite nicely, thank you very much, out of this government. And likewise, this political party is doing quite nicely out of the donations that come from that large sector. Uh, we've had millions of dollars in donations made to the Liberal National Party since they were in government uh, from the big mining companies, from the gambling industry, uh, from property developers, from all sorts of people that want favours and what policy written that favours their bottom line. And uh, hey presto, we get tax cuts for those large companies and tax cuts for the wealthy. So it sounds like they're delivering quite nicely for their donor mates. In terms of fossil fuels, well, we know that they give tens of millions of dollars in donations. And uh, this government continues to deliver fossil fuel subsidies, accelerated depreciation that nobody else gets, discounted diesel fuel that nobody else gets, and now they're getting a fast tracking of environmental laws. And you know what else they're getting? They're getting a, a commission stacked with representatives from the gas industry that don't have to disclose their conflicts of interest to the public, or in some cases don't have to disclose them at all, and a commission that's recommending, who would have guessed it, yet more investment in gas infrastructure. This government is delivering quite nicely for the big polluters, who happen to be big donors to its political party, and it is absolutely uh, negligent in dealing with the climate crisis. The government could be investing in job-rich renewable energy. It could be funding schools and hospitals, but instead it's dishing out tax cuts to the wealthy and to big business, and it's paving the way for yet more dirty gas to wreck our land, to wreck our water and to wreck our climate. The time for this discussion has now expired and we'll now move.